Hello, everybody. Uh, can you can you all hear me all right? Welcome, everybody. Um, I imagine you can all hear me. Otherwise, uh, please raise your hand if you can't hear me. Uh, we're, we're good on, on, on audio, yeah? Very good. That's uh, the one thing that's a little bit difficult to, to manage on, uh, on Zoom, of course. Uh, you never know whether people hear you or not until it's too late and you've spoken for 20 minutes and you discover that nobody has picked up anything. All right, um, welcome everyone to today's um, um, in introduction to uh, the um, degree uh, Traditions of Yoga and Meditation. Um, my name is Ulrich Pagel. I'm the convener of the degree and I have been uh, running it uh, since inception in 2012 or so. So we've been running it now for seven, eight years and that's uh, continually growing um, in, 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 in student interest. Uh, we have, Taken, undertaken some changes over the last few years, but, but not significant changes, uh, changes for the better, we hope. Um, and um, one of the things that we, we did adjust since our early days was we introduced a greater contemporary component because we discovered that an increasing number of students are not only interested in the um, historical aspects of yoga and meditation, but also how yoga and meditation shapes our current world. And with this in mind, I thought it would be um, useful to um, give a talk about modern mindfulness. Modern mindfulness is, of course, um, a, a well-known phenomena um, in, in the 21st century, not only in the UK, but in the US and in continental Europe. And modern mindfulness um, is really um, beginning to shape how we view um, well-being um, you know, across society. Here in the UK, modern mindfulness can now be described through the National Health Service. So in other words, you can go to your doctor, report chronic illness, uh, depression, or other things. And then that your local doctor, your family doctor, could then refer you to a um, modern mindfulness um, course. In other words, you know, modern mindfulness, uh, through its therapeutic application, has found its way now, or has the potential to find its way into our, um, into the lives of every citizen um, in the UK, certainly, and also in um, in, in European uh, countries to to a large degree, and that and that changes in many ways um, the game for 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 mindfulness, because in the past, of course, mindfulness has been a practice that is securely anchored. In the Buddhist tradition um, that uh, was embedded within a fairly secure and tight sociological um, frame of reference. Originally, mindfulness, as no doubt you, you, you all know or suspect, um, served to bring about awakening, the awakening that the historical Buddha discovered. And now mindfulness is applied um, not so much to um, escape samsara, to not so much to achieve nirvana, but to make life in samsara more bearable. And that is something, of course, the Buddha never set out to achieve. The Buddha wanted to persuade his followers to, uh, to leave the world, to attain enlightenment and nirvana, because he discovered uh, or he considered samsara to be intrinsically painful, intrinsically suffering, in, in intrinsically um, deplorable. While through modern mindfulness, um, contemporary therapy, um, life in samsara becomes bearable, more bearable perhaps. Um, so a lot of questions arise from that as you can immediately see. Is, 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 is that a legitimate use of mindfulness? Can we, should we use mindfulness to make life in samsara more bearable and thereby sort of, in a sense, sort of covering over the cracks, removing the, you know, the, the spiritual aspiration of Buddhism, which the Buddha tried us to lead us out of samsara, rather than trying to sort of cover over temporarily um, this suffering that we experience in the world. So those are just some of the issues that uh, we need to consider, we need to flag up. Um, other issues in, include social justice. Um, modern mindfulness, as we discover in a minute, was founded in the 1980s by American uh, uh, 
Buddhist, American scholar, American medical practitioner. And from very early on, the focus on modern mindfulness was white middle class America. And it became then white middle class Europe and white middle class UK. To what degree is it justified? Is it justified at all to, to, to make modern mindfulness a preserve of the well-to-do middle classes? How do we deal with social or racial exclusion? Um, mindfulness sets the goal very high. It sets out to liberate everybody. The Buddha set out to liberate everybody. And now through the back door, it, it seems that you know, social injustice is becoming to be associated with modern mindfulness. You may say, well, it's a big, you know, if it's just a small people of white middle class self-help um, practitioners who pay their own money for it and they dedicate their own time, that is yeah, perhaps not, 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 not avoidable. But now that modern mindfulness is being rolled out across society, now that the taxpayer is actually paying for the modern mindfulness um, treatment that you or me can receive, is it not time for modern mindfulness to, to raise its game, so to speak? Is it not time to take on a much broader ethical remit and um, be, make a serious effort to, to, to help all sect sectors of society? And you could argue that the socially disadvantaged are the ones that most urgently need mindfulness therapy because they are most likely to be suffering from chronic disease. They are most likely to be suffering from depression. They are, they, they are most likely through their social disadvantages to be in need of um, well-being treatments. So there's a lot of stuff tied in or tied up uh, in modern mindfulness. And let us now sort of look, explore modern mindfulness for 20 minutes or so in a more systematic fashion. Um, I'm sharing my screen, which is always a little bit um, of an adventure. Um, so I'm now, I thought I'm now in the slideshow. Play from the start. Okay. Now I just see that. Okay. I'm now sharing my screen. I guess you can all see the screen now. Yes. Can you see, see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Let me just um, toggle it to full screen. Okay. Very good. Um, still not. Okay, there we go. All right, so mindfulness in public discourse. This is really the, the, the topic of uh, today's talk. And uh, um, as I said before, I'd like us to, to, to explore some of the key themes in modern mindfulness. Um, what is the significance uh, in the modern world? What are its connections to um, historical practices and, and, and how those two intermesh. Modern mindfulness, is it a fad or is it the future? Is it the, 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 the holy grail in well-being therapy? You can see modern mindfulness and on Time magazine, um, you, um, we have a wisdom conference, uh, the, the FT magazine reports to it. Um, we have journals devoted to modern mindfulness. So, so, so clearly modern mindfulness is no longer a niche um, um, therapy. It is something that has come to international awareness. When in, the, in the UK, we had um, a mindfulness all parliamentary um, group exploring how modern mindfulness can be um, brought to British um, society overall. The Houses of Parliament in, in Britain as a result discussed mindfulness, modern mindfulness, and its application in society. So clearly modern mindfulness has changed significantly from the niche practice that we envisage as a lone Buddhist monk sitting in the cave somewhere in the Himalayas on the forests um, of Sri Lanka or Thailand. Uh, modern mindfulness is, has become huge. The trouble is we don't really understand what modern mindfulness very often is. 
very difficult to agree on a, on a specific uh, definition. It means different things to different people. And let us look at some of the issues here. We have one of the de definitions that John Kabat-Zinn himself, so he, the inventor, if you like, of modern mindfulness coined was, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way on purpose. Uh, I'm sorry, I just have to sort of juggle the screen here because uh, you can't see it. Um, in the present moment and non-judgmentally. The controversy here is over the term present moment awareness. Um, the canon um, does not really focus in Buddhism on the presence. According to the Buddhist tradition, sati, which is the Pali term for mindfulness, um, means um, primarily an act of remembering. So in the Buddhist tradition, remembering or, or mindfulness is really embedded in the past. So instead of being a function of memory, in modern world, it is depicted primarily as a function of attention to the present moment. Instead of being purposeful, it is without an agenda. Instead of making choices in modern world, it is choiceless without preference. And that is a real problem, a real issue, because in, in Buddhism, mindfulness is employed as a choice. Um, it, is, it has a purpose. And the purpose, of course, of mindfulness is awakening. And the choice is to choose virtue over non-virtue. Now, in modern interpretations, therefore, this choice, this purpose, appears to have been removed or, or reinterpreted. So can true mindfulness be non-judgmental? And the tradition, according to the Buddha and the Buddhist um, treatises, say that it cannot be non-judgmental. So we seem to have here a very significant um, departure. Let me see. Let us look at the roots and see where, where this departure comes from. Um, modern mindfulness was introduced in 1979. That is when the, 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 the mindfulness-based stress reduction um, training was founded. It was founded by a person called John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Initially, it consisted of group programs developed to, to uh, treat patients often struggling with um, a broad range of conditions, physical or mental illness. After 20 years, so in, the, um, in 1999, he founded the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine and Healthcare and Society, again in Massachusetts at the medical center there. He began to apply for government grants in order to embed mindfulness practice in clinical application. Back then, and until quite recently, Kabat-Zinn decided not to bring out or even mention Buddhist connotation in mindfulness. And he did so really above all to um, prevent um, people viewing modern mindfulness as somehow a religious practice. Um, he did so because he sought um, grants, he sought the, um, advocated for an application of modern mindfulness in the medical sector. A medical sector, of course, that has no room for religious beliefs and practices. Early areas of modern mindfulness um, focused on the progressive acquisition of, of, of awareness, of mindfulness. And the purpose was for the practitioners no longer to instantaneously react to emotional triggers, but to develop a buffer zone through which the response to an event would be separated out from the event itself. Kabat-Zinn aimed to produce a distance between the event and the reaction to the event. And through that distance, he believed um, stress, um, chronic uh, illness, uh, and others um, poor health factors can be mitigated. He produced, or his teams produced, nearly 1,000 certified uh, instructors in over uh, 30 countries. And he, through this certification process, instituted um, a formal tradition or, or school of mindfulness-based 
um, practices. Um, much of the focus in those early groups was on informal practice, um, but the, the participants were also encouraged to incorporate mindfulness in their daily routines. And it led um, in those practitioners who applied it consistently to a, to a form of self-management, to a form of coping. That is to say, it introduced the ability to, to, to better understand um, an emotion and um, mitigate or, or manage its response to that emotion as it um, unfolds. In other words, it reduced the physiological effects of stress, of pain, or of illness. It led to an exploration of the experience of stress and uh, illness itself. But people learn to live better with stress, illness, and so forth. And what the idea that sort of drove that is that we need to develop a form of equanimity or equipoise in the face of change. That change manifests itself in our lives um, all the time. And that we need to embrace it rather than set out to oppose it. Because it is only through the enmeshment of change in our lives that we begin to, to deal with it in a better way. We need to understand change in a non-judgmental way. We need to um, stop reacting in a positive way or in a negative way to change, rather than um, treating it as a, a constant and inevitable feature in our existence. This then produces a sense of clarity, a sense of serenity in our life in, in every moment. Um, it leads to um, a mindful state that um, is embedded in our lives all the time. Here we have a few more definitions um, that we encounter in, um, in mindfulness um, contexts. One developed by Bishop um, in, in 2004 reads, a kind of elaborative non-judgmental presence-centered awareness in which each thought, each feeling or sensation that arises in the attentional field is acknowledged and accepted as it is. So what are the elements of this definition? One element is non-judgmental um, responses. The other uh, key term is the production of a type of awareness, an awareness that allows us to observe without over-identification. In other words, we observe a mental reaction without getting totally drawn into that mental reaction. Let us say we observe pain without developing dislike, uh, anger, or frustration um, in response of that pain. But we develop to understand what this pain is, how it manifests itself, and where it comes from. In other words, it, mindfulness allows us to disengage to create a difference from our habitual compulsive patterns of discursive reactivity. It produces a reflection, a response to the difficult circumstances of life. And, and those circumstances of life can refer to a, a whole range of situations. It is not necessarily limited to stress, to chronic illness. Mindfulness through Kabat-Zinn and others becomes a tool of managing life in a better, um, in a more productive way. Where does, where does modern mindfulness come from? And a lot has been written on that. Most people um, for 20 years or so connected modern mindfulness, Kabat-Zinn's tradition of modern mindfulness, primarily with the Theravada traditions of Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. And while that is certainly true, um, in large measure because of his link through the Inside Meditation Society that um, emerged around Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein, and Salzburg in the US, it is also um, a simplification because Kevin Zinn, like most Buddhist, Western Buddhists of his day, were equally exposed to multiple traditions. Uh, Kabat Zinn was exposed to the Mahayana tradition of Vietnam. He was exposed to Zen tradition of Japan. 
He even had connections to the Tibetan tradition. So Kabat Zinn's modern mindfulness does not exclusively spring from the Theravada tradition, but it's it sort of sprang from a mix of traditions that Kabat Zinn, like so many other practitioners of his day, the 1970s hippie area, um, mixed together and uh, created their own new thing. And that's an important aspect of modern mindfulness in many ways. It is much more eclectic. It is much more um, mixed um, and um, contaminated, if you like. Uh, it draws on so many different strands that um, its Buddhist pedigree, if you like, um, has been, um, has been um, contaminated, if you want to use a negative word, or um, brought together um, across traditions, if you want to interpret it in a more positive way. So, um, what, is Buddha, what is mindfulness for? It, it serves in Buddhism, of course, to reduce enlightenment, uh, to reduce suffering, to bring about enlightenment. In um, the Mindful Nation uh, report of the UK Parliament, it serves to produce health care. It prevents discretion, it supports well being, it uh, introduces resilience across the population. In education, in, in particular, it is used to develop uh, pupils that are able to focus better. In the military, it is used to develop um, resilience towards stress, to turn soldiers to more balanced, more effective weapons. So mindfulness is weaponizes um, people in uh, the military. In um, executive context, it introduces a better trained workforce, more sharper manager um, uh, who are able to discharge their, um, their tasks, their work in a more effective way. In mental health, it um, um, leads to emotional regulation. It prevents depression. In its most general form, I guess we could say um, it to character uh, builds. It uh, introduces resilience in our lives. So as you can see from those different uh, topics here, mindfulness has a broad range of applications. And, and this is at the same time, it's, it's, it's asset, it's strength, and it's um, downfall in, in, in some sense, because it is uh, nowadays used um, without any regulation um, in a whole variety of contexts. Um, contexts that um, make room for or allow for misrepresentation um, or misapplication. Here we have some further details at the workplace. It reduces burnout, sickness. Uh, it introduces um, um, flexibility, focus. Um, and so forth and so forth. Here are some courses, some quotes from a course that was conducted in South London in, in 2019 when the practitioner, when the teacher asked the students who had participated in that eight week course, so what did you learn from our um, um, course over the last uh, few days? And some said, I'll be able to step aside from stress and drama and deal with it better. Um, some said we are aware of unhelpful narratives made up in my thoughts, uh, pausing for breath when negative thoughts appear, and so forth, and so forth. So you can see that the participants in those courses um, very much reflect um, or key into the aspirations or aims of mindfulness. It, it, it does indeed seem to introduce a distance to, the, to a mental event. It does indeed introduce greater resilience in the life of people and, 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 and has, a, has a, a general well-being impact. It can reach um, into the spiritual domain. If you look at the last quotation, you see here um, a quote saying, my eyes have been opened again to how important life and living every moment is. So it introduces a sense of spiritual fulfillment that this particular person um, perhaps had not had before his uh, mindfulness introduction. One of the key founders of 
um, the mindfulness tradition. Um, and one of the um, people who influenced Kabat-Zinn was uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. Through his book, The Miracle of Mindfulness, that he published in 1976, he reached a huge audience. Um, he is a member of the uh, Japanese Zen uh, tradition, even though he, he is of Vietnamese um, descent. Um, because of the Buddhist orientation of Vietnam, he was exposed to both Mahayana East Asian Buddhism as well as Theravada um, Buddhism that you, you encounter in uh, Sri Lanka. So because of his, his, uh, his environment in Vietnam, he was uniquely placed to bring together thought from Mahayana Buddhism uh, with a focus on the Bodhisattva and the Theravada tradition. And this ability of synthesis really shaped Kabat-Zinn's interpretation of modern mindfulness. Um, it, 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 Kabat-Zinn in some ways continued um, to uh, enmesh those two streams of thought. Thich Nhat Hanh was without doubt one of the most important, um, certainly South East Asian teachers um, for Western Buddhist communities. Um, he is um, tremendously wide read, widely read, um, and uh, students uh, continue to um, deliver his teachings, perpetuate his tradition um, in the UK, in Europe, as well as um, in the US. He has written um, over 100 books uh, in English, including, of course, his Miracle of Mindfulness um, publication. Here we have a picture of the master himself, uh, John Kabat-Zinn. He was a bio biologist by training. He studied, as we said, in, in, in South Korea, uh, in Japan. Um, and um, much of his early practice uh, he, he, he developed with the uh, insight of Vipassana traditions that emerged in um, uh, at the West Coast of, of America and then later on also at the East Coast. Um, the famous um, teacher Suzuki Roshi um, shaped his understanding of Zen Buddhism, so, so did Shugyam Trungpa's and Thich Nhat Hanh's interpretation of Buddhism. So Kabat-Zinn really drew on um, all three uh, key Buddhist traditions that existed uh, in, South East, in South Asia or Asia um, at the time in the 1970s and 80s. He describes his own practice as a mix of Zen and Vipassana element, now leaven by Dzogchen. So very clearly um, 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 a, a composite tradition. His best known book is probably Full Catastrophe Living, um, which uh, operates within a secular scientific framework, uh, where, but yet where he uh, identifies modern based, uh, mindfulness based stress reduction as grounded in a universal Dharma understanding that is congruent with the Buddha Dharma. And that's a really important sentence for our understanding of mind mindfulness. Kabat Zinn understands mindfulness to be a universal tool, a universal phenomenon, a universal teaching. Um, it, he says it's congruent with the Buddha's teaching, with the Buddha dar uh, Dharma, but he really maps it as a tool for the whole world to consider. Um, and that has given rise to some very interesting phenomena. Um, first, of course, it introduced mindfulness to the West, and we understand that now. But it also is now beginning to bring mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy back to East Asia. In other words, he re-imports um, mindfulness to the traditions from, from which he borrowed it in the first place uh, with his particular interpretations, with his particular um, take. This is a very recent phenomenon. You can take modern mindfulness courses in Hong Kong, in Bangkok, in Singapore, and other places in Asia. And uh, we need to see how this will play out over time. 
in order to sort of implement the universality of mindfulness, he really rejects all constraints of history, of culture, of religious uh, mani um, manifestations. Um, he, in other words, has extracted modern mindfulness and um, um, sanitized it or sterilized it uh, to make it more likable, to make it more accessible to um, his still largely Western followers. What does based, mindfulness based uh, stress reduction look like? The, the formal practice consists of a body scan uh, where the individual becomes mindful of, its, of his or her various uh, bodily organs and parts. It can include mindful movement, where often based on yoga, such as walking. It includes sitting in meditation, focusing on breath, on body, on the sounds of thoughts, um, on loving kindness, and so forth. Now, the inclusion of loving kindness is very interesting because loving kindness originally was not a key feature of modern mindfulness. Um, it was not a key feature of Theravada Buddhism, in fact, but it's found its way into modern mindfulness through uh, Kabat-Zinn's exposure to Tibetan Buddhism, uh, through his exposure to Mahayana Buddhism, where compassion or loving kindness, of course, has become a key um, or has long been a key uh, feature. In other words, you know, loving kindness is a, an, an attestation of the um, syncretic nature of modern mindfulness, a, a, a tradition of, of, of mindfulness that brings together elements from um, practically all um, Buddhist traditions. In addition to those formal practices of the body scan, of meditation, um, modern mindfulness based stress reduction also involves some informal practices, such as mindful eating, being mindful in the routine activities of the day when we are brushing our teeth, when uh, we are doing the washing up. Um, and exercises help to bring awareness into those daily experiences. We take note whether they are pleasant or unpleasant, um, and we take note of our reaction to those experiences. The format is usually in that of a group session, um, usually eight times, uh, two, two and a half hours, often accompanied by a retreat day. Um, the teacher um, participant inquiry is a, is a key component in the practice. Um, and once the hour is up, once the, the session has finished, the practitioner is encouraged to continue to do his work at home. Let us here now look briefly at the increasing popularity of mindfulness research studies. Here you have a, a, a graph and it only reaches to 2015, but you can already see the exponential growth of uh, interest in, um, in mindfulness. It started out almost invisibly in 1994, uh, but then um, multiplied in from nine, 2008, nine onwards. And um, the, the curve of course continues. If I were to uh, continue with, um, if I were to extend the, the reach of this study, the uh, red bar um, would continue to increase in length. One of the important sort of changes that were introduced in mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy was the foundation or the inclusion of cognitive therapy. This was founded in the 1990s um, uh, by a psychotherapist from both the UK and Canada. Siegel, Williams, and Teasdale all played a role in that. Um, the, Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy focused on depression. So unlike a mindfulness-based stress reduction, it had a very uh, narrow um, and um, sort of mind component. In many ways, the practices are very similar to those of MBSR, but the key focus is on the, on, on, on the analysis of negative thinking and to explore how negative thinking can lead to depression. So it includes exercise from cognitive therapy um, as, as, as well as mindfulness-based uh, um, stress reduction therapies. 
a word of caution so um, and and um, MBCT has been criticized for that um, mindfulness cognitive therapy should not be applied to uh, uh, to uh, patients who are in an experience of depression at the same at, at that particular moment because it can make that depression worse it can deepen it so um, mindfulness is useful in the treatment of depression. Most people agree on that, but it needs to be carefully um, calibrated and above all timed to make sure that it doesn't um, exasperate um, depressive experiences. One of the key moments in the, um, the development of um, MBCT was the um, approval that it received from the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. This is the key institute in the UK that approves medical treatment. Um, it NICE um, recommended um, MBCT as uh, a tool for patients at risk of recurrent depression. But in practice, even though NICE recommended it, uh, not every GP um, has access to mindfulness based um, cognitive therapy, simply because the, the rollout does not provide complete coverage. For example, the Southeast um, in the UK, the, the, one of the wealthiest parts in the United Kingdom, has a far better coverage of uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy than other areas, um, um, such as Wales, um, where that are typically less affluent. So we do have variations within um, availability of um, MBCT. Here are some areas of research, um, cortisol level, uh, depth activity of amygdala, uh, and um, other biological factors um, are, are, are mapped. Depression, emotional regulation, chronic pain, um, tinnitus, and so forth and so forth. So a great deal of work has been done and continues to be done through um, MBCT. Uh, it is particularly used in, um, in, in addictions, alcohol addictions um, um, or, or drug abuse as a tool to um, sever the link between um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the substance and the addictive reaction that um, develops in the individual. So you can see here in its variant as cognitive therapy, mindfulness um, has acquired a very broad, a very wide ranging um, area um, of application that uh, reaches well beyond the uh, traditional um, Buddhist um, um, framework of application. Further areas of research are covered on, on this um, slide. Um, what is perhaps um, most, most important is um, the, um, the work into the brain's default mode network. Um, that is to say, it is used to, to, to still the mental activity, to reduce the mental wandering and uh, introduce a focus um, within those who were applied for that. Because often it is this mental wandering that is being held responsible for the um, increasing um, volatility of um, a person's uh, reaction to, um, or unregulated reaction, we should say, to, to the world and then to negative experience. So through the, the stilling of the mind, if you like, um, the reaction is, is challenged, channeled, it, it is focused into a more managed, a more controlled re reactive state. Let us now say a few words about Mindful Nation, the UK report. Um, this is, uh, was a big deal in the, in the UK. 
because we had, as I mentioned before, an all parliamentary group that convened in 19, 2015 of over 100 members of parliament and peers to participate in mindfulness courses. Um, it was a singularly important document um, for mindfulness in Europe. And um, one of um, the students on this MA participated in, 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 that in the production of that report. Tessa Watt, she, um, she led the uh, initiative that um, gave way to the report, in fact. And it was a, it was a great asset um, for the students on this uh, MA to have her in the classroom and to explain out of her own experience what were the factors that brought Parliament's interest to mindfulness and, 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 and how she managed to engage with parliamentarian and uh, direct um, their, their inquiry into mindfulness. Mindfulness in this report focused on healthcare, education, the workplace, as well as criminal justice. Those were the areas that were deemed to be most important areas of application or with the greatest potential application of mindfulness. Um, mindfulness is used also privately in, in other domains. Um, um, I, I mentioned uh, defense a little while ago. Um, only a month ago, um, several um, defense groups uh, from the US and the UK above all held a conference on mindfulness application in, uh, in, in, in military contexts. And it was extremely interesting um, event for um, the, uh, you know, the study of mindfulness. And uh, it was um, quite a remarkable testimony of um, the, the way um, mindfulness has now found applications in, in so many other areas and originally um, minded. Um, you can imagine what the Buddha would have said had he found out that his own teachings were now um, um, applied in a military setting. He would, I imagine, not have been pleased. Here's some examples of um, the workplace study. People, the, the group counted the sick days, lost to stress, depression, anxiety that have increased by 24% since 2009, that mental illness costs the UK economy up to 100 billion uh, pound per year, and that uh, mindfulness can help reduce stress, depression, and therefore um, reduce uh, sick days. Um, it can um, reduce the uh, cost that is uh, incurred through treatment of mental illness. Here is the person who um, founded um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, Professor Mark Williams, and uh, his um, key publication, Finding Peace in a Frantic World, um, one of the most important studies of um, cognitive therapy um, yet produced. He uh, worked out of the Oxford Center of um, Mindfulness, um, but uh, has recently retired. Here we have uh, further publications on um, the mindfulness um, um, in um, application in, in, in depressive uh, contexts uh, produced at Oxford, at Bunga and Exeter universities um, by the mindful way through depression. Um, so again, we see that uh, the in-depth research carried out at Oxford, at Bunga, at Exeter has then led to um, publications which in turn paved the way, of course, for um, increased promulgation of mindfulness practices, not only in the medical arena, in the National Health Service, but also in um, uh, self-help groups um, and uh, in society um, by and large. Some examples, how mindfulness and neuroplasticity work together. Um, taxi drivers in the UK have to take a very difficult exam and um, mindfulness um, training has shown to help them deal with the memorization of the, um, the cityscape in London, for example. Here we have an example um, uh, or testimony of the um, uh, 
um, presence or inclusion of mindfulness in the National Health Service. Um, this one is dated to 2007, which is called a quick reference guide uh, to depression, management of depression in primary and secondary care. And it speaks about uh, the application of mindfulness in those contexts. Some areas, how mindfulness improves people's lives. Uh, we don't need to cover that again. This is a summary. It deals with stress, depression, emotional regulation, chronic pain, addiction, cognitive skills, relationships, and well-being. Um, so this sort of sums up the areas of application of mindfulness. At SOAS, we teach mindfulness, of course, in our degree, traditions of yoga and meditation. Um, we have um, three um, classes, um, um, three lectures devoted to mindfulness. Um, one uh, sets out the classical um, application and the uh, origin of mindfulness in, in the historical um, period of, of Shakyamuni Buddha. We have another uh, class that connects mindfulness with the Vipassana practices. Um, as it evolved in uh, America in the 1970s. And then finally, we map the evolution of modern mindfulness and most importantly, application of modern mindfulness in the contemporary world. Um, you will be able to um, explore mindfulness should you chose to do so. Should this be your interest in your MA dissertation? Four years ago, I had a student who did that um, in connection with University College London, where she explored mindfulness um, um, training um, application um, in a clinical context. So it was a very, very interesting um, publication, or uh, not publication, dissertation, because she drew on clinical data, live clinical data that emerged from trials at University College London, and then um, um, interpreted those, um, those data um, um, through the lens of mindfulness. It produced an, an outstanding dissertation. And this is the kind of thing um, that we like to promote through the dissertation. Dissertations are important parts of your studies. Um, often uh, dissertations represent the original reason why you come to source to study um, yoga and meditation. So we like to turn the dissertation into a platform, into an opportunity um, for you to, to, to apply what you have learned during your studies at source uh, to the original interest that brought you in the first place to those studies. Here we then have um, um, more information about uh, London life. Uh, you will have access to the slides um, later on. I'm sure the school will make them available to you, but um, that is perhaps a, a good moment to stop this presentation and um, allow for questions um, after um, at, at, at this point. I will now stop sharing and uh, open the floor to questions. Anna, will you be um, moderating questions or answers, or shall I simply do that myself? Um, either is fine. We haven't had any in the chat, but if anyone has any, feel free to put your hand up and we can, okay. we can um, ask them directly. Okay, this is a fairly small group, so you can also simply jump in. questions at the moment? Nothing in the chat either. Oh, hello. Yes, hello. Sorry, I'm just, I logged in on two devices because one was freezing and so I was just hearing an echo. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, very um, informative and inspiring. Um, I will try to turn my screen on at some point. Um, I just had a question about the students that have been uh, perhaps in the last year, last few years, um, about what they've gone on to, to do in the world. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, very important question. Uh, I get that question uh, in every um, you know, uh, application or recruitment cycle. 
the students come to the degree from all walks of life and that, that is really true we have uh, we have teachers we have journalists we have lawyers we have bankers um i had a member of the armed forces last year in in, in the in the classroom um all of them come to the degree because their whole a phenomenal passion in the practice of yoga and your practice of meditation. Most come to the degree through, from, an, from a background in yoga, about 60%, 30% meditation and 10 come from other degrees. They, many of, the, of, the, of my students um, are active yoga teachers. Um, they, um, some of them run fairly large yoga centers in the, in the UK. Um, and um, many use the degree um, to, um, to to deepen you know, the, the understanding of the history of the theories and intellectual cross fertilization between the traditions of yoga and meditation. And when I look at the websites of those students today, or sometimes I've done a little exercise, many put the MA onto their website as a, as, as a testimony of their further study. Um, so that is uh, one application, one, one use to which the degree is put. Um, some go on to research. Um, every year I have uh, one or two students from within the cohort who um, embark on PhD research. There can be PhD research in the, uh, at source. Um, I had a student going to Oxford, another went to Santa Barbara. So the, the, the research trajectory is, is, is open um, to, to, to many of them. That is um, another example. I had some student who started writing on yoga um, without um, further study. He published a very interesting book in many ways, um, just uh, I think last year or so. So as this go into well-being or continue to, to be in well-being, I mentioned my student who worked at UCL to uh, interpret um, uh, stress-connected data, and, and, and she then returned to her to her uh, clinical work, and uh, you know, applied to to what she could, um, you know, what what uh, the 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 perspectives that we brought to her through this de degree. So we have a, a whole range of, of of applications. Some I'm sure simply do it uh, because it it, you know, it helps them inform their own practice. Um, it, it, it helps them sh shape what uh, you know. What they experience and understand perhaps what they experience in their own yoga and meditation practice. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and making decisions of whether to do a 300 hour a yoga therapy training, 858 mm -hmm. hour, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting to, 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 to see the different mm -hmm. pathways. And um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was about the accessibility for, um, you know, people in society um, who may be you know, disadvantaged in some way or come from some kind of trauma, whether that be racial trauma or, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm quite interested to know whether there's been a diverse um, applicants or, or, or people joining um, the degree and <laughs> whether there's anybody on the faculty um, from sort of, in a, you know, in perhaps indigenous heritage um, that's also teaching. Yes, um, at the 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 class um, or the you know, the student cohort of yoga meditation is a truly inter, an international um, um, body. We have uh, this year a good number of uh, students from, from from China, from Japan, from Korea. Uh, we have uh, students joining us uh, from Europe, although this is um, getting less because of Brexit. The the the, the student fee status has changed. Uh, we have uh, some students from uh, Caribbean or uh, Black African background in class, uh, a, a minority, but, in, but a, a growing um, minority. And it's very interesting because the perspectives those students bring is often hugely original. They, I had a, a dissertation proposal um, brought to me just the other day where somebody wants to explore the tradition of um, yoga in Nigeria and um, the area in, in which it's used in Nigeria, um, well-being uh, above all. So, so there's a, there's, this is sort of opening up completely new ground. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very excited to be able to, to supervise that. 
Um, the about half, I would say, of the of, of the participants continue to be um, of Caucasian um, origin, um, approximately. Uh, so the exchanges. I have uh, a Tibetan monk in 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 the current cohort. I have uh, students from from India, three or four South Asian descent. Um, so it, it it is it, it is a truly international group. I had. Uh, a student flying in from Lisbon every week. Um, so that, that sort of brought commuting to an extreme. Um, it's, um, I think people increasingly sort of begin to, to, well, to be able to participate in those discussions, you know, beyond, uh, you know, beyond the boundaries. And, and the fact that we have taught online, of course, has, has made it easier during the, the, the last year. Um, we, we don't know where the school will go, where, where COVID will go. I think they will continue to be blended learning of some form. But uh, the, yeah, the, the school wants to have students on campus because we believe that face-to-face -face communication is at all times preferable. But we are you know, increasing, increasingly using across the board um, online resources. Ironically, the MA Traditions Yoga Meditation was has done that already since inception. From the very beginning, the degree was designed to be built around the professional or busy domestic lives of our students. So we we had online lectures way years before anybody else had it. We had. Um, online repositories of our readings um, years before anybody else did it. Um, it meant that we were very well prepared to deal with COVID. So, so that, that is good. But in a sense, we, sort of, we lost, lost a little bit our edge technologically because not everybody does it. And uh, we uh, need to sort of see whether we, we, we want to you know, drive that further or whether we want to stick to the formula that we have applied in the past. Thank you. The fact that the MA is you know, delivered uh, either, either full time, part time over two years, or part time over three years, is, um, I think it's, it's, it's a great advantage because it, it allows students to really adjust their, their, their study uh, to, their, to, their, to their real lives. We you know, very much appreciate that students. Not all students have the, the leisure or the financial resources to dedicate to full-time study. Many of our students continue to work while they're studying, and then they you know, often take the two-year pathway or the three-year pathway. And what is very good is the university allows you to switch. So if you were to start full-time and then you discover after three months, oh, this is really not working out for me, I'm, I'm, I'm under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, I'd like to do it. At a, at a reduced pace, then you can switch to two year or three year midstream through a single email. It's a very unbureaucratic, a very easy process. Um, so it you know, allows you to, to, to adjust your, your study mode uh, really without complication. Um, you, you ask about uh, this delivery of the program. Uh, at, the, at the moment, there are four people delivering the program. I'm the convener and I contribute. Sean Horson um, is our um, expert on world philosophies. She is contributing to the core module. We have then James Mallinson, who is a very well-known yoga um, scholar um, and um, who uh, works on Hatha yoga. Uh, he contributes, and we have Peter Flügel, who works on the Jaina traditions of yoga. So those are the, this is the core group. Um, but as part of your studies at source, you will be able to take an open module as well. And that open module can be any MA module, any MA course that we offer at the school. It could be Sanskrit, it could be Chinese, it could be Arabic, it could be politics in, in South Asia. It could be historical exploration of a certain period or region in Africa. It could be economic course on economics or art history. Um, there are no boundaries set. So you can either study a subject that complements quite narrowly what you do within the degree uh, modules, or you could 
pick a subject that you always wanted to study, but never really got around it, never really had the, the time or the, the resources to study. And um, yeah, this then becomes available. Um, and um, the school, you know, uh, yeah, of course, encourages that. Thank you. My pleasure. Are there any further questions? Are you still there? If no oh. one else wants to go, I'll go again. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, of course, shoot. Um, if, for a full-time time program, how many hours a week do you think is a realistic, you know? <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a fiendishly, fiendishly difficult question to answer uh, accurately, of course. Um, because yeah, students come to us with different backgrounds. Some of the students just you know, came straight out of an undergraduate degree and in full swing of study. So for them, it's often relatively easy to write essays because they have done it. They, they, they know how to you know, approach academic publications and so forth. Others have had um, um, a, a break in their education, yeah, maybe raised a family, maybe um, embraced a career in, in I don't know, in, 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 in banking or so forth, and want to want to return to study. So the um, and that of course means that people need to put different amounts of time into the degree. As a, as a rough guide, and that's a really rough guide, and you will understand in a minute why it is a rough guide, we, under, we expect that full-time study takes about 35 hours per week. Part-time study over two years uh, takes about 17 hours, and part-time study over three years takes up about 13 hours per week. So you can immediately see all, all we have done is really divide the regular working hours by either two or three to, to achieve that figure. Um, my, my, my own sense is that these figures are not terribly off, um, but they, they vary so much. Uh, typically, if you do full-time study, you will need to attend um, four lectures a week which um, takes then each lecture and seminar together amount to two hours, let's say, that generates then two eight hours of time. I would say that each of those lectures calls for, you know, at least three hours of preparation, reading around it. Um, so, you know, you have then 24 plus eight, yes, 35 is reasonably close, but this, you know, doesn't apply uniform across all months. Remember that um, teaching runs only from October till the middle of December, and then from the first week of January to the um, to the end of March. You then write essays and you write your dissertations. So there, there are sort of there are gaps in in, in in the schedule, and it it gives you flexibility. You know, you can shift work around really as you as you need, as you as you want. You could, you know, if you have time on the weekend, you could dedicate part of the weekend to that. If if um, you have family, then maybe you want to do it in the evening. Um, the readings will all be available online. Um, you don't have to come to source regularly, um, except for the classes. Um, and uh, essays are submitted online. So it, it allows you to to, to, to study um, a great deal within the comfort of your own home on your own resources. You don't have to worry about the availability of books, for example, in the library, if, um, you know, if, if you don't have time to, uh, to, to spend in the library, for example. In addition to the lectures and seminars, we provide workshops on essay writing. We provide workshops on dissertation writing. Um, the, the whole program is really very well supported through those workshops. And the workshops fall into two categories. There are those that we deliver program specific um, through um, yoga meditation staff. I run many of those. And then the school itself, SOURCE, has more generic workshops on essay writing, on um, um, dissertation uh, production, um, and so forth. And, and, and these are all quite well integrated. Um, so the, the, the first workshops deal with book reviews, which then support the essays, the essay workshops support the essays and then lead to the production of the dissertations. So they, they all hang together quite, 
quite well. And the, the progression of many of our students is, is truly breathtaking. Uh, in particular with the part-time students over two years or three years. The first essays are often quite laborious and difficult and not hugely successful. But then some of them, by the time they reach the dissertation, they, they, they get the dissertation published in peer reviewed journals. So the dissertation becomes much more than just a component of the MA, it becomes a platform for something new in some cases. Not, not in all, obviously. I think in total, I had about five, six dissertation published um, over the last uh, few years, which is you know, a small component, but it's, a, it's still a significant component. And um, when I then see the, the, the journey of, of, of improvement over those three years, it's, it's, it's really, really astonishing um, you know, how, how much headway they have made. And, and the skills that you pick up along the way um, are not, not skills that you can only apply to yoga meditation. Once you know how to write effectively, how to engage with evidence effectively, you can you know, use those skills in, in, in any walk of life. Um, you know, quite, quite beyond what, what you have done at source. Uh, we just have one question in the chat, actually, um, which I think we'll probably have to make the last question. Um, Saskia has just asked if the part-time three year is always fully in person or if it um, is online as well. Um, it's a difficult question because um, in, in the past, before COVID, it was always in person, but it typically meant um, one day a week um, in London, um, because then you, know, you will then do your other modules um, on, on that one week in the other years. Um, so if you, if you live somewhere in the UK and you can manage to come to London on, 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 on you know, one day a week, that is what we had in the past. Now, um, during the last two years, um, much of it was online. During the last year, everything was online. Now we have blended learning. And the, and the school envisages to continue that blended learning pathway because it, it, it works well for many students. Um, it leads to innovation in, in program delivery, which of course is a good thing. And it also you know, allows SOAS to reach out to students to, to which it formerly could not reach out. Um, so, for example, at the moment, we have uh, our lectures delivered online and we have a small group seminar teaching uh, on campus. So uh, I would you know, deliver a lecture online and then on the next day or two days later, I would have the students in, 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 the, in, in the classroom and uh, we will then discuss the content of the lecture. Um, my, my, my own sense is that um, this will probably continue so that there will be an, an online um, component uh, and that may vary from program to program. But my sense is also that students will be asked to be on campus um, to, 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 to some degree. And we, we want students to be on campus to some degree to you know, promote an identity as a student, to promote student cohort, for many students, learning in groups is good. It works really well. It, um, it is good for mental health um, to, to meet your peers uh, and not to be cut off from, from, you know, from university life overall. Um, can we make um, arrangements occasionally that uh, allow us to minimize travel to London? At the moment, we can. I had a student who had significant changes in her domestic life. She now moved to, to the Lake District, to, 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 to Lancaster. And um, rather than coming every week to London, they think she, we agreed she would come every second or every third week to London and, and you know, participate in the online seminars uh, very actively. So, so we, we, we try to be um, as flexible as we can, but uh, it, it would be misleading to say that, yes, absolutely, you can continue to study fully online, um, you know, in, in perpetuity. I, I, I simply do not know. Um, and I suspect if COVID recedes, then we, school, school will want us, our students to, to, to come to source at, you know, at intervals at, at, at least. Okay. okay. 
Hannah tells us this was the last question aloud. Uh, it's a real pleasure meeting you. Uh, thank you so much for finding the time. Um, this is a sort of a collective event, and uh, some of you perhaps have questions that you didn't want to bring up in, in, in this con context. Do, do send me an email uh, if you have um, any, any other question, any issue uh, you know, in personal circumstances that you want to um, raise with me. We can easily arrange for another Zoom meeting one to one if you were in London or near your source. We can uh, meet on, on campus as well. Um, or you know, we can just do it through email. It's, it, it's entirely up to you. I'm, I'm, I'm available for those conversations. I, I very much enjoy participating in those conversations. So do, do let me know um, if there's any other question that you have. Um, as you know, if you put in an application, you can always defer or reject the offer. If you did, do get an offer, it doesn't tie you into anything. and It doesn't generate any commitment. Sometimes it's useful to know to have an offer and then you know, begin to make plans around that offer. Um, if things change, as I said, you can defer by year without needing to reapply. So it's a, it's a good way of testing you know, what is possible um, really with, with, without, without firm commitment uh, on, on your part at all. And I'm of course available to help you with the application if you have any, any questions, although the process is fairly well mapped on the, on the website and it's, it's not a very onerous um, application process itself. All right, this is now, Hannah, now we're coming to the most awkward uh, part of the lecture. I've never, it's always easy to start Zoom meetings. It's always a little bit awkward to end Zoom meetings. Um, so uh, Hannah, I, I leave it to you. Why, why don't you um, um, navigate yourself now through the, through the closing of the, of the call? Yeah, no problem. Um, hopefully that talk was to, useful to everyone. I've just popped um, Orich's email in the chat. So if you do have any questions, you can use that. Um, there is a student and alumni panel, which started about 15 minutes ago. But if you did want to join that, um, you can join that now as well. Um, thanks so much for attending. Very much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Well,